Hello, this is Brad from Survival Comms. Today we're going to continue our dive into radio direction finding by discussing and demonstrating a light aircraft automatic direction finder, or ADF for short. In part one of my fundamentals of radio direction finding video, I gave a Cliff's Notes overview of the use of long wave AM beacons and medium wave AM broadcast band stations for radio navigation purposes. And that's the purpose of our device here. The device here on our bench is a Bendix King KR86 ADF receiver, which is a 200 to 1750 kilohertz AM receiver capable of a minimum of one kilohertz tuning steps. The display on the left is our manually adjusted heading indicator, and depressing this knob also allows us to test the meter of movement. Now the contrasting needle in here displays the position of a tuned and received signal in relation to the aircraft position and heading. The three position switch under the tuning display selects the receive mode of ADF which brings our loop and sense antennas into the receive circuit and provides ADF functionality. The antenna position which only allows the sense antenna to be in the circuit and the radio functions as an AM radio receiver. The third position brings in a beat frequency oscillator for CW reception if required. The antenna and perhaps BFO positions are the positions you need to be in to find, identify, and receive signals, leaving the ADF functionality for its intended purpose as reception quality is diminished when ADF is selected. And finally, the volume control acts as an on-off switch as well as controlling the volume level for the balanced audio output that is looking for a 500 ohm load for interfacing to an intercom mixer or headset. The antenna we have is the KA42, which is a combination of two loop and one sense antennas under a radome. The loop antennas are attached to the receiver with two 15 foot long shielded cables. A random length 50 ohm coax BNC jumper connects the sense antenna. Now these cables have all been transected in the example I have, so I will be building my own cables for our content and will show you the pinouts and enough of the techniques and procedures to get one of these up and running. Short of very worthiness, but this is for learning purposes after all. Our receiver is mounted in an aluminum tray that retains the receiver and the connector is mounted to the back of the tray as shown. Manipulate the tray latch and the receiver will separate from the tray pulling straight out. Then remove the shield and tray connector plate to allow us to work on connector P101. This is our rear connector for our receiver and we're going to have to populate this in order to energize it and you can see they've transected all the wires. This slides in the back of our receiver and this whole plate goes in the back side of our tray. We don't need our tray so I've removed it and this shield goes over top of that and that's been removed as well. There are 18 slots and pin 1 is on the left, pin 18 on the right. So starting here we have a black wire and that is our aircraft ground. We have red wire and that is our B plus, which is 13.7 volts. Now this wire here goes to pin three and fits into this circuit here. And this goes to our sense antenna. And this right here has eight volts coming out of the receiver to it. Pin four is this yellow wire and that is our dimmer circuit, which controls the illumination. Then after that, you have five and six, and five and six is this red and black wire, and they both get tied to ground, which is on this plate that goes to the tray, and then they've tied an additional ground wire to that there. Now we have our, these two wires here, which are seven and eight, which are a black and a blue wire that come off of this circuit here, and these are tied to the sense antenna. Pin nine is a no connection. Pin 10 and 11 are our 500 ohm balanced audio out. And then pin 12 is a no connect. And then the balance of our pins are hooked to our loop antenna. And we have two different cables going to our loop antenna. And they're both shielded cables. The shields are pin 13 and pin 18. And here we have a white and brown wire that will be for loop cable one. 
And then for loop cable two, you have a black and a red wire. You change the position of these two conductors depending upon if the antenna is on top of the fuselage or below the fuselage. Now the other control and audio pins are going to be no problem to tie into. These, however, for the loop antenna are going to be a little bit of a pain in the butt. So I don't have the tool to disassemble this connector correctly, and I don't want to damage any of these pins, and I don't want to solder directly to the receiver itself. I want to maintain the usability of this particular connector. So I'm going to have to very carefully solder wires to each one of these here, and we're going to start by removing the insulation from each one of these right here, and I'll use a small pair of hemostats or something because we don't want to affect our solder connection by leaving this insulation in place. Okay, we've gotten our insulation off and you could see whoever originally installed this didn't do a very good job with their Molex crimpers. It's unfortunate. I wish I had a tool to lift these out of here, but I don't. So we're going to go ahead and go this route. So the way we're going to address this is, is I'm going to flux the crap out of these connectors and I'm going to tin each one and I'm going to hit it quick with a very small tip because I do not want to damage this nylon connector body by overheating it. And we'll just go ahead and tin that wire. Line this up and try to heat them both up at the same time. Just like that. And we'll just follow suit with the rest of the connectors just like that right there. Well, good news. We've made all our connections and we didn't burn anything up. Now, if you're ever doing this for real, you want to keep these conductors as short as possible. You want them to run right into that Molex connector here. You don't want to have lead lines like this because you're concerned with RF interference. For the purposes of what we're doing here, we're not concerned with RF interference, so that's not going to be an issue. Well, I've completed populating the back of the tray, which is the main connector for the ADF receiver. This is my loop antenna connections here. I've used a DB9. I'm a big fan of DB9 connectors. I've got my DC here and my audio out. And this cover will screw back on here. And then the whole assembly goes in the back of the tray. The receiver slides in the tray. Now let's mess with our antenna connection here and hook the cables up to it. I've already removed the center screw from this and once you do that this whole connector slides off just like that and you can see the pins here. And this is the inside of our antenna connector here and you can see our two cables are separated and they're connected in here and we have a few components in here. It looks like we may have a resistor or a coil in there. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go ahead and remove this screw and I'm going to remove the insulation from these conductors here. Well, you can see the inside of our housing now that I removed this insulation. This is excellent quality cable too, by the way. It's a shame they cut it away. It's got a very durable jacket on it, foil shield. And you can see our colors here. We have our black, red, and shield. And then we have our shield white and brown. And what I'm going to do is, is just remove this insulation here and we're going to tie this cable in, two of them, one on either side, and then run those to a female DB9 that'll plug into the back of the ADF receiver. Well, we've got our antenna connector completed, and rather than run that other cable I'm going to use inside of there, I decided to go ahead and break it out outside of this connector housing, just like I did with the back of the tray. I'll screw it right back together just like that. Let's see how well this radio receives, and so you can listen to it on the speaker. I'm going to run it through my 600 ohm to 8 ohm transformer here that I use for my BC348. Here for Universal Roof and Contracting. Now is the best time to schedule that free roof inspection with 15% off your roof replacement and repairs. <laughs> just an atheist, a non-believer, I and mean, he was militantly against God, hated the idea of God. Live. Um, my gosh. It, it, right? It's, it's untold. 
Okay, let's demonstrate our ADF receiver. Right now we have our ADF receiver set up and we're using the sense antenna right now, volume control. This is our heading control and we're tuned to an AM station right now, which we're receiving through our headphones here. We're powering everything off of a 12 volt battery. And this is our loop antenna our sense antenna, which would be connected here, is not functional on this. So I don't know if the preamp's bad or the signal's too bad, but this is inoperative. So in order to get this to work correctly, I've had to build a sense antenna and hook to that. Here's my homemade sense antenna, and it's working out very well. And all that is is a couple of 225 microhenry inductors in series on a PVC form. And I use that as a loading coil for some special projects. Let me demonstrate how this functions. We're currently receiving a signal at 1170 kilohertz. And we want to use that as our radio bearing. The compass rose that's on this display does not auto update. So we've set our bearing in the direction that our aircraft is headed right now. So we're at 130 degrees. Now, what we need to do is, is turn on our ADF and this ADF indicator here is going to change in relationship to our aircraft direction which we're just going to move our antenna of our simulated aircraft and that's going to show us the movement. So let's go ahead and adjust towards our station here and you can see as we start to turn and now we're following our radio bearing. Now let's say that our current bearing on our compass is showing 180 degrees, we can just go ahead and adjust our heading indicator here as such. And as we deviate from this direction, you can see it change back and forth and back and forth. So what is the secret sauce that makes all of this work? I'm going to relate this to you to the best of my ability and understanding. Use of two fixed loop antennas mounted 90 degrees to one another coaxially in what is called a Bellini-Tosi antenna system. Part of that system is a radio goniometer in which the loops terminate into stators, which are our field coils, and they're mounted coaxially 90 degrees apart. There is a third coil in our goniometer, and that is our search coil or rotor which is inductively coupled with our field coils and allows the antenna to behave like a rotating loop. The influence of the sense antenna and the E-field resolves the bidirectional ambiguity. Now if anyone else has more insight into this, please share such in the comments. Well, if you've made it this far, I hope you've enjoyed watching this content as much as I enjoyed making it. I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comms. Till next time.